communication with several entities from the great beyond and the insights they've given her into the plans of the elite, the state of our reality, and the hidden history that got us here. It is a wild ride I can't wait to take, and I'm honored to have her here. Tracy, welcome to THC. Ah, thank you so much. <laughs> wow, that uh, makes me sound so exciting. <laughs> <laughs> We know how it is with these attention spans. You got to grab them quick, but you are worthy of it. Thanks for being here. This is a real treat. I am a big fan of your work into alchemy and money, and I'm sure we can eventually get into that. But to start us off, this new book, Clock Shavings, is very interesting because I've heard your interviews over the years, and it's clear that you have a deep understanding of magic, certain entities, and invocation rituals, but you seem to deflect a lot of the questions that are asked about your own personal experiences. Didn't really want to talk about that journey a whole lot, but now you have laid it all out there, and man, does it include some far out stuff. I've read several excerpts from it. It is very interesting. But to start us out, I guess I would ask, you know, what was it that got you to start taking this spirit entity communication stuff more seriously in a culture that, at least on the surface, really writes it off as largely silliness. Well, you know, uh, actually, it would just be the fact that it worked the first time. The first time it worked, you know, that intrigued me, and it was pretty much impossible to leave the subject alone from that point. So, yeah, yeah it's just personal experience, I guess. I, I hadn't really spent too much time thinking about it before we did it, you know, which is basically it started with my husband. Well, he wasn't my husband at the time, my husband-to-be. We were, you know, roommates at the time, and we were running the the magazine Dago Bear's Revenge together, and we were doing some research into, you know, Holy Grail related studies, Priory of Zion, things like that, and wanting. And at the time, you know, we were one of not too many people really pursuing that subject, and we were, I would say, you know, among the experts on the topic at the time. We were emerging into that field, uh, me and some of the other writers for the magazine, so. Uh, we really just wanted to know more about the subject. We wanted, and I, and there were there. I'm sure you've looked into that subject yourself. Mm -hmm. and many of the listeners have, probably. It's it's a very intriguing but confusing subject. You know, <laughs> you can just spend years following trails of clues and kind of get dizzy after a while. It all seems so interesting and meaningful, but you know, you never really know. Um, where what it's all leading to <laughs> agree and so it's definitely something that can be kind of exasperating and at the time we just thought well wouldn't it be great if you could actually talk to one of the the guys that was supposedly involved with the priory of zion uh who was the artist jean cocteau we were looking into a lot of his stuff at the time we were trying to decode some of his uh paintings and films and writings to see if it it pertained in any way to the Priory of Zion the, or uh, the mystery of Renle Chateau, the story of the Merovingian bloodline, the Grail, and other occult subjects. And we were just uh, tr trying to uh, find greater insight into that. So we decided to talk to the guy on the Ouija board. And, uh, you know, we did get a response right away and we talked to him several times. But I would say we got a very weak response in comparison to what came next. He basically told us that we, if we really wanted to get the answers to our questions, we had to talk to Cain. Wow. Uh, so um, Cain from the Bible. Yeah, Cain of Cain and Abel, right? I mean, that's a pretty yeah. uh, powerful entity there. You know, and well, I knew that from some of the research I had been doing and writing I had been doing, that Cain seems, at least according to some other... Uh, historians basically they think that maybe Cain was based on a, uh, a you know real historical figure that can be found certainly in uh, the history of Mesopotamia but also there seem to be um, recollections of this figure in history uh, from other cultures as well that you know this is really one of the first kings and the king of an empire really and that it may have been basically the same empire that's remembered in the story of Atlantis. Wow. Uh, that, you know, he may have been like the king of a very a large uh, kingdom and very influential in history. And then the, sto the, the story in the Bible is really just a thumbnail and a, and a metaphor for what happened with Cain. So anyway, you know, I, I knew a little bit about that stuff, but you know, obviously I learned a lot more once I started actually talking to Cain. <laughs> uh, so <laughs> I would say that um, things really got rolling a few months into the conversations with Cocteau when we when we called up Kane instead and started really getting uh, very interesting responses. 
Whoa, this is wild stuff. And it's so awesome that you got that personal validation at an early stage because it's so key for people to not just write it off. Because when it comes to people's thoughts on communicating with entities like this, I think the mainstream, if you divided them up, the majority would probably give no credibility to it, think it's just silliness. And then the second largest group, I'd say, are folks who probably believe it has power but are very fearful or superstitious about it. And to me, that's the biggest clue that it's something to pay attention to because it seems like classic propaganda. You know, first deny all existence of it and aggressively claim that it's just a bunch of nonsense. But when that doesn't work, you say, oh, well, yes, it does have power, but stay away from it because it's all dangerous and evil. And right there, you probably got 90% of the population to avoid it for one reason or another. It doesn't really matter or why but do you think that's kind of what happened over time well basically if you can talk to uh spirits from beyond you're getting one type of glimpse of what's going on beyond our visible reality here i'm saying that like we live very much cut off from the bigger picture of what's going on right and we're meant to, it's clear to me that we're, that we're in some kind of prison basically. And, you know, we're being deliberately blinded from everything else that's really going on. Yeah. And I've only gotten just a, a, a tiny taste of, you know, what the truth might be. <laughs> um, and I, so the, the, I, basically I'm saying, yeah, of course it's taboo. Yeah. Of course they try to keep you away from it. And who, who are they? I mean, I, you know, the uh, governments throughout history, uh, the religions that they foster and propagate, uh, always trying to keep this, uh, you know, the keys to the kingdoms of heaven and hell, basically, out of the hands of the general population. Yeah. And you could say that's, uh, you know, that they're trying to control everybody, which is true. And also, in a way, what they say is right, too, in that, you know, it is dangerous because you're you don't know what you're. I don't know what I'm getting involved in. No one, no one else does either. I don't think. How could you possibly know? You're just like grasping. You're reaching through the veil. You're grasping around. And you don't know what's on the other side or what it's going to do to your hand. <laughs> <laughs> you're reaching through. So um, it is dangerous, it's scary. Oh, I can see why people see it that way. You know. Yeah, yeah. I mean, and it is funny because I can get most people to acknowledge that most of history has been dominated by powerful secret societies and clubs. And I can also usually get them to acknowledge that these groups put a lot of energy into symbolism and occult rituals and practices of these magical arts or secret scientists. But people tend to not make the connection that maybe the magic or this communication with entities is a major reason why these groups have kept the power for so long, you know? Well, it this is what has really been so revealing to me. I mean, the experience of talking to them myself and also seeing the things that they tried to get me to do, the, you know, cause they did try to persuade me to do certain things. Wow. And, uh, they, you know, they have a different, uh, I would say heretical, per, uh, perspective or a different version of almost every story from scripture. And it's always, you know, portraying a different character, you know, usually the bad guy as the good guy, uh, <laughs> you know, they, <laughs> yeah, I can, I would think so. It's an agenda is what I'm saying. Yeah. Uh, there's definitely an agenda and, um, it's really given me a glimpse into, I, I'm, I think they deal with other people this way. I think they deal with the people in the secret societies you're describing this way, especially the leadership. And I, and I realized basically what a lot of these secret societies are based on, which is yes, this, this communication the packs that people make with these entities, Man. the uh, basically the whole structure of, of an organization like say the Masons is probably based on something like this where, and they're probably dealing with the same entity because after uh, I was talking to Kane for a long time, we eventually got referred to Baphomet and that's where, you know, we really got, I would say even more insightful information about all, all sorts of things <laughs> about history, and magic, and that is a really powerful name, but I'm uh, kind of curious. You said that this communication kind of intensified with each, you know, new being you, that you interact with. How how did it kind of evolve and intensify? Was it a changing of methods, or was it just way more obvious that that a being was interacting with you? Well, no, it was obvious the whole time that we were interacting with something. But like Cocteau, for instance, had a very hard time communicating. I would say. Uh, most of what he would say is kind of nonsense numbers and letters. 
uh, then there was speaking in French and um, I didn't even follow a lot of it because I didn't speak French very well at the time. Uh, and also um, just weakness. It didn't seem weak in the beginning because it was my first experience. But after communicating with Kane, for instance, I immediately noticed a difference of, yeah, intensity in, because you can feel the um, presence of the spirit as it's talking, as it's moving the uh, planchette around on the Ouija board. You know, it, with a weak spirit that's having a hard time communicating and a hard time, I guess, garnishing the energy needed to communicate. It will, for one thing, have a hard time spelling out words correctly, a hard time saying the right thing. They'll forget how to say things. And then for another thing, the, the planchette just doesn't move as quickly or as powerfully. And when it get, really gets going, when it's very powerful, it sometimes moves, you know, scoots out from under your fingers even. It moves so quickly that you can't follow what it's saying. You have to have someone else writing down the words, the letters as they're being spelled. And ideally, this is what we ended up doing, uh, videotaping, so, just so that we could go back and get an accurate transcript. Wow. And, you know, so you, you'd be getting these messages, and there's no way that you or any of the other people could be projecting it. It's not coming from your subconscious or anything, because I don't have any of that information. <laughs> I mean, there was some really complicated stuff that I couldn't have possibly known. No one else there knew. Uh, I don't have the imagination to come up with that. Uh, I'm not that poetic <laughs> as some of the things they said. And furthermore, it's just moving so fast uh, that your mind can't spell out words that quickly. And a lot of times they'll misspell things and then they'll go back and correct themselves too. So Interesting. Let's let's talk about the Ouija board a bit because I think for, for some people this is a red flag. Even people who believe in occult communication, I mean I hear a lot of people say that they doubt the Ouija board in particular. And I think part of the reason that, uh, for that is because it's made by a giant uh, toy-making corporation today. Even though they didn't come up with it, they only bought the patent from a guy who had it once, his, uh, you know, once he died, he, the family sold it to them. But really, I mean, these powerful corporations, they know plenty about the esoteric arts, and anyone who examines their logos will see that. But in terms of the Ouija board, what might you say to someone who doubts the usefulness of it or the accuracy of it? Well. I don't know what you mean by accuracy, but um, as far as when you're trying to define, divine a message from beyond, I would say it's the most accurate in that it'll give you a message, you know, spelled out in words that you can interpret. You can have a whole conversation. Whereas, I mean, what else can you do like that except channeling directly, which I think is even more dangerous because then you're actually kind of letting something more into you than than I think you are when you're playing with a Ouija board. But not only that, the accuracy of channeling is just harder, I think, to gauge because it's coming through your own mind. You're really kind of put, I think you run a risk of really putting things in your own words or interpreting, editing while you're channeling. So I think when you're doing the Ouija board with another person, it really kind of objectifies the whole thing, pulls you out of yourself a little bit, and you just basically become a tool, uh, you and your partner, whereby they're able to write out messages that can be very clearly read. Now, if you're trying to, you know, in interpret uh, coffee grounds or in pig entrails or something, if you're trying to read tarot cards, you know, it's much more open to interpretation and also just vague. I mean, what you can't get very specific answers to specific questions. So I just think if you want to actually talk to them, talk to something from beyond that might have the um, perspective of, of a being from the other side, this is going to be the most useful tool. And as far as the, you know, the William Fold uh, Parker Brothers Ouija board, I mean, that's, that's what we started off with with Cocteau. But very quickly uh, discovered that they had their own ideas in mind. Baphomet actually dictated a design, a new Ouija board design, which we produced. It's a lot more interesting. Um, and you can see that uh, there's a little picture of it in the book, and we're going to put out a larger version of it that people can use if they want to. Um, I find it easier to use because it, you have a little bit more space to move around in. Um, it's easier to set the letters apart. The interesting thing about the design that was given to us by Baphomet, I didn't understand the meaning of it 
for months or maybe even a year until you know after it was given because um <clears throat> for a long time Cain and Baphomet both kept emphasizing the alphabet itself they kept going through from a to z and then b to y and all the way like that from the beginning to the end and inverting it basically you know Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and I was wondering, what is the meaning of that? We kept asking them, what does it mean? We got uh, different answers. Finally, I, I just was doing some reading one day, and I realized, oh, that's the Atbash cipher <laughs> that uh, <laughs> the, was, has been interpreted as being uh, connected to Baphomet's name. The fact is you can uh, put the, the name Baphomet, I think it's a, if you convert it to Aramaic, and put it through the Aramaic version of Atbash, uh, then the result that comes out is is Baphomet. Wow. Oh, no, it's, it's Sophia and Baphomet. That's right. How The interpretation is that Baphomet basically is a code word for holy wisdom, divine wisdom, uh, and that the, maybe even the Templars were using this this uh, cipher, basically. So it's a cipher, cipher that, for one reason or another, is associated with Baphomet. It's been printed in books they even re reference this in the the da vinci code i seem to remember that the the, the character that sophia you know they at one point mentioned that her name was convertible into the name Baph baphomet via this cipher so huh. but i had totally forgotten i didn't i didn't realize what the atbash cipher was i remember reading about it but i didn't know that what you do to make that cipher is you invert the alphabet hmm. so that's what they wanted us to do on the board and um, so it's been that way ever since we've been using it. And uh, it's interesting because it makes different patterns, actually. The way they um, zip around on the board, it just makes interesting patterns because of the way the alphabet is uh, arranged sometimes. That's cool. So, I mean, I thought your conversations with Baphomet were pretty intense and pretty interesting. Most people will know this entity as the goat-headed hermaphrodite, largely associated with the pentagram and evil things like Satanism. But how would you describe Baphomet? Do you think some of those ideas are misconceptions? Obviously, you know, you were, you, you were saying that the good guys become the bad guys and there's a lot of manipulation involved. Is, that, uh, is Baphomet a victim of some of that? Well, I'd say that Baphomet is you know, a, is the devil in a way. Wow. But it's a particular expression or uh, of the devil. So it's the alchemist, <laughs> basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, he's kind of a, I say he just, it's, I don't know, because that seems easier to me. But the truth is that every time Cain or Baphomet would refer to Baphomet, they would use, uh, refer to Baphomet in feminine. So, uh, you as, but uh, yeah, as, as I think you mentioned, uh, it's a hermaphroditic entity. Um, I think that maybe the most important facts to understand what Baphomet is as an expression of the devil is to go back to the, it, you may have seen this sigil of Baphomet. I believe it goes back to uh, this magician named Stanislaus de Guita, I hope I'm pronouncing that correct, something like that. Uh, hmm. At any rate, he had in one of his books th these sigils uh, that were expressions of Baphomet. And on one of them, on one, basically the front side of it, it had the goat headed Baphomet inside of a pentagram, the inverted pentagram. And uh, it said Leviathan around it. Oh, and, and it also has the um, names Lilith and Samael, which are two demons that I'll describe in a moment. Uh, and then on the other side, you have Adam and Eve. They, they it, it's it's a, it has like the uh, upward pointing pentagram, and it has a, pic, a picture of a man, and then it says Adam and Eve. Now the uh, reference to uh, Lilith and Samael is important because the the way the Kabbalists describe Lilith and Samael, these demons, they're like the the primordial demons. They say basically these guys are the serpent in the Garden of Eden, and it's a hermaphroditic serpent hmm. that has both male and female aspects. The male is Samael, the female is Lilith, and that basically these two guys were split purposely by God, and it resulted in Samael basically being castrated and separated eternally from Lilith, so that they can't mate anymore. They can't have sex because somehow if they do it will result in the destruction of the universe so you have these uh you know formerly united serpents 
now separated and you know in pain of separation from each other uh, and sexual frustration. Mm-hmm. And uh, what it appears happened, according to if you piece together all the different um, rabbinical uh, Kabbalistic stories about the Garden of Eden, the things that went on there, and then also afterwards, after the fall, the things that happened to Cain and Abel. And you start looking through all these things, basically seems to tell the story that that Samael impregnated Eve and was probably the father of Cain. And also, uh, reflexively, uh, Lilith also seduced Adam and was his wife. And they have lots of demon children together that are out there in the ether somewhere. And they're menacing mankind. They're always trying to uh, uh, cause trouble for humans. And one of the things they're always trying to do, the Lilim, as they're called, the daughters of Lilith, is incarnate into human bloodlines. They seduce men. They uh, find they, their children are born and actually grow up in royal families. They're, she's basically infiltrating royal and holy families to try to get her children in, in line for those thrones. And you see this going on in the Bible, and I think it's probably going on today. Wow. Yeah. That, <laughs> yeah. That's like, that's intense. I mean, obviously, bloodlines for the elite have been super important throughout history, and to think that. Maybe they're communicating with some otherworldly entities and they're being influenced or seduced and that they're being infiltrated. I mean, that's pretty intense, but it fits the story because when you look at the deeper levels of the elite, they seem to be in communication with something for some reason. Well, both Cain and Baphomet had a lot of interest in their human descendants on Earth. And in fact, that was their only interest. They wanted to basically kill everyone else except their own descendants. And that doesn't mean their descendants are safe. <laughs> but uh, that what I when I say that uh, there's some evil coming from these spirits, the ones that I talk to anyway, uh, I would say what really made me believe that, you know, was that they basically just displayed a very uh, hateful anti-human attitude. And it had everything to do, they said, with god's preference for us Mm. basically uh, the serpent was offended that he was asked because he used to be an angel he was asked by god to bow down to his new creation adam and uh he didn't like that this is a story that's in the quran you can also find it in a book called the books of adam and eve which is older than the quran Hmm. and then this is a story that was told to us again by baphomet and then kind of referenced several times later, like, uh, this is the real reason why I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, and so it's like nothing he, personal even, really. It's like, yeah, we're just the preferred younger brother, basically, or, or Adam was. And we're the children of Adam. And that's uh, the source of the frustration. Also, of course, they were uh, cast into hell. And uh, it seems that that happened after the fallen angels, the demons, actually tried to... Uh, mate with humans or did did successfully mate with humans and apparently this was a a problem for god and uh, so he cast them into uh, some sort of prison that's under our underneath somehow the world that we live in now maybe in some other realm or something well obviously in some other realm and so they're very mad about that and they really want out and um i think that they're trying to manipulate people that they have under their control here to get them out and you know they basically they're right now they're uh, working with secret societies and utilizing all of the mechanisms they have available including the media uh economics you know all, all sorts of uh you know aspects of civilization basically that they now control mm-hmm. uh the demons are using people in, to try to construct a situation that will somehow allow them to have one big jailbreak and all get out <laughs> but um but in the meantime, they, they're still always trying to get out or to get one little foothold in this world. And, the, and what it took me a while to realize, but after analyzing the transcripts repeatedly over the years and looking at other clues as well in, in history and mythology, is that they basically they're not alive, right? They're in some sort of nether realm. Mm-hmm. Their existence is kind of negative. And and. and at one point, Cain even said this, you know, I am not alive. Don't <laughs> don't talk to me as though I'm alive. I can't relate to what you're saying because I'm not alive. 
because they're not alive, they need to somehow or they desire to feed off of the life that we have here. Mm -hmm. And when they can get a little bit of that, they hungrily feast on it. And also they just desperately want to get a foothold in this world where, and one of the ways that they do that is through people that they are able to possess. So uh, yeah, they just, sometimes they literally, their motivation is just to be able to, you know, breathe air and eat food and smoke cigarettes, (laughs) experience life for, for a little while. Yeah, man, this is where it gets really interesting to me because I've had several guests who talk about the constant references to the abyss or the great beast, and there's tons of 666 symbolism out there. I mean, it's the logo for Monster Energy Drink. It's the logo for the Chrome browser and the CERN Center. And I think it was also at the Emmys, the stage was formed by three sixes on top of each other. And (laughs) it's it's weird. I, I don't necessarily get it. And I'm also skeptical of anything that comes kind of from the Christian perspective, because I grew up that way and, you know, felt like it was a lot of manipulation, but it does seem like there's something deeper there that it's built upon. I mean, do you think that's accurate? Yeah, I mean, sure. You know, I'm not here to uh, promote any religious point of view. I'm just kind of saying what they said and how it it does seem to match up with what uh, a lot of uh, orthodox religions will tell you about the, how the world works what the, what the what's the universe what, what's going on and most of the the religions will tell you you know there's a realm below and a realm above and there's good guys and bad guys and here's what the bad guys are trying to do and honestly so much of that was confirmed by these beings and it w- wasn't something that came out in the first conversation you know but uh because we had a lot to talk about you know i knew i had a lot of uh knowledge already about you know, occultism, secret societies, and things like that. So there was, I think, quite a lot of basis to, for us to build a rapport, I guess, with mm-hmm. each other. And so <laughs> um, I was able to kind of milk this stuff out of them, I guess. And also, I think they lose their ability to lie after a while, you know, or they, things just slip out, mm-hmm. you know, <laughs> Or they, they get comfortable talking to you and they just kind of tell you, oh, by the way, we hate humans. We're trying to kill you all. <laughs> um, wow. Whereas, they, you know, after, after months of talking about uh, scriptures and, and uh, like esoteric analysis of things, the, you know, they'll, this, this kind of stuff will just slip out every now and then. So That's uh, <laughs> so interesting. I mean, do you, do you think some of these 666 references that we see in the mainstream culture are part of this foothold that you were talking about that they're trying to get? Yeah, but it, I mean, I don't want to be too alarmist because, of course, it's ever since Jesus, basically, people have been saying that the second coming is happening and the end times are coming. So, you know, I guess it could it could very well be they're always coming. You know, the, the, this is an aspect of life. Uh, I think there's some truth to that. Uh, <laughs> that the end is always near, but um, but it does seem like in popular culture people are so comfortable with it now. And if you really want to be paranoid, sometimes just watch fiction, television shows, and movies. Sometimes even don't watch, but like look to the side and just listen to the dialogue. Mm-hmm. You'll pick up on things that mean so much more outside of the context of the the film itself. You know that you you can think that sometimes I think these films. The story itself is like the, just the first layer, you know, that's Mm -hmm. for the public to consume. And then if you look deeper, there's an entirely different, not just plot, but message. And, and so what I find is say for instance, He-Man. Okay. (laughs) Right on. (laughs) My son is only a year and a half, but he really loves watching He-Man. And so we've been watching the whole thing. I've seen these episodes over and over again. Every single He-Man is about the same thing. It's about the fall of Eden and it's about the apocalypse, which are connected events and possibly the same thing in a way. The, the end is connected to the beginning. Mm-hmm. Just there's, you know, there's Beast Man. There's uh, Skeletor. There's a, there's, an, uh, there's a Beast Island, I believe, at one point. And so what you see over and over again is the story of there's the, the demons or the bad guys that are somehow in, imprisoned on an island in a castle in the in the dungeons they're forced to work in the mines and then uh you know they're always plotting to get out and then what are the what do they want to do they want to um sack eternia eternia is eden and this is what um 
the, the story that Kane kept telling us, and which a lot, a large portion of clock shavings is really devoted to and analyzing this story, mm-hmm. um, is about the fall of Eden. He said the the game of chess is actually based on this. That is that was an interesting aspect to it. Yeah, the uh, the different colored tiles are actually like, uh, you know, the merging of the two realms or something like that. I th- yeah, I think so. Well, it's 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 kind of uh, complicated. Still, we're still figuring out some of the the meaning of what was told to us. But the 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 story that first came out, the way Kane described it, he said that. The fall of Eden and the fall of Atlantis were the same thing and that it was really a war and that war resulted in the submerging of this kingdom where at that kingdom there was this thing called the Ark. Now in the story of Noah's Ark, the the Ark is a boat and then of course in the story of the Ark of the Covenant, the Ark is a, uh, you know, something that contains the uh, essence of God. Mm-hmm. Well. The way Cain and also some of the other beings described it, because they all talked about the Ark. And what they all said is that basically the Ark was this, what they called one box of things. It is the treasure box. It has all the power in it. All the, all the things that you would want. <laughs> the Pandora's box. Exactly. The, the Holy Grail. And really the, all these symbols, the Grail, that you've heard the Grail can be a stone or the Grail can be a cup. Well, it's because it's, it's all part of the same contraption. Mm-hmm. It's a box that somehow contains something that can give you anything you want something that can it is ultimate power like godlike power and uh, and uh, once i started looking into the eden story a little bit more not only in the bible but then also some of the way some of the secret societies portray it in their rituals i got a bigger uh, idea of what he was talking about and the idea is that yes this there was at one point the the beginning is thought of as eden there was this treasure box there that contains, like I'm saying, this this holy grail sort of object. And really the value it had was that it was it could give eternal life. That was really what Cain cared about. Hmm. And he said that he was trying to, he wanted youth for himself. He wanted eternal youth. And he was trying to save Eve, his mother. He didn't want to watch her die. So that, uh, you know, his lust to con- contain and control this box which then makes you sort of the controller of everything if you have the box it give, it give, makes you in charge of everything somehow that's he, he's, he kept describing it also as the throne of adam so he said that there was this war in eden over the throne of adam which was and it was also the ark and the war was between him and children of his actually descendants of his that had grown up and had their own kingdoms hmm. you know so and he said i asked what kind of war is this what kind of uh weapons are you using he said swords and axes so you know then i'm thinking like lord of the rings <laughs> <laughs> about all these guys like in some sort of fan- fantasy realm having an old-fashioned war yeah with hand-to-hand combat <laughs> but then um and then but then somehow that results in this whole kingdom going underwater eden years later i looked into this whole story a lot more like i said and piecing it together uh, also with the uh, the Mesopotamian stories of the flood, and they also then all those stories uh, link up to this uh, this object, the plant of immortality, supposedly that was there in the realm of the gods. What what it seems like is that almost all of Eden got submerged, mm-hmm. but then there's this one part, the what the Rosicrucians refer to as the supernal Eden, that uh, was preserved. Like you know, in the Bible it says God put the flaming sword around the tree of life to keep it from Adam and Eve. Mm-hmm. After they ate from the tree of knowledge, all of a sudden God became concerned that they would eat from the tree of life and become immortal. And then nothing would be uh, impossible for them, he said. Like they have the knowledge of God now, and now if they can just live forever, they'll be able to do whatever they want. So I'm not going to let them do that. <laughs> you know, so they <laughs> right. cut off the whole realm where the tree of life is, whatever that is. Mm-hmm. It gets really tough because it's all seeped in uh, symbolism and, you know, it's probably not a literal tree, but it's something. It gets it gets kind of hairy. Well, it's probably not a literal tree, uh, right. but I'm getting glimpses the more I look into it uh, of what is it, you know, and why? how does it provide immortality? And it's uh, strangely it has something to do with the consumption of blood and the consumption of vital energy. 
Wow. Now, this is something that we hear about all the time in the conspiracy world that the elite are doing. I've heard really creepy stories about them doing full blood transfusion rituals with children. So the idea, this vampiric idea of consuming blood is not that it's not really that far removed from modern times. No, no. I mean, I, th I think every day uh, if, if I went looking for it, I could probably find some news story that connects to this, uh, whether it's like a story of someone that attacked another person to drink their blood or just a, a science story that comes out and oh, by the way, uh, you know, there's this great anti-aging technique that comes from drinking the blood of young people. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I, there was a story about that just a few months ago and similar things all the time. So yeah, I mean, it's true. It, and it's almost obvious if you think about it, but it's something that's been known about forever that, you know, this is a, this is one of the ways of preserving yourself is to consume the essence of things that are already young. In a weird way, if you think about the efficiency of the universe, you know, I have a lot of guests that talk about the universe being a, a perfect system and all this. It's kind of morbid, but it's almost like a checks and balances system for the population. Because if you want to keep the older people around longer, you're going to have to kill the younger people. It's like almost like a, a weird balancing act to make sure that too many people aren't around because you can't have one without the other. Are you going to have young people growing up or are you are going to have old people sacrificing young people to stay around? Well, I mean, what's the, it's hard to justify the value of keeping a population of elderly <laughs> and uh, not allowing young people to live. Agreed. So, agreed. I mean, and, and of course it's, it's, that's why I objected to what you were saying about uh, keeping some kind of balance. I mean, how is it any kind of balance? Of course, old people that are do that are participating in a system like that are basically just refusing to die or to age, and uh, they're always going to just, of course, because they're any any old person, any person who's an adult is stronger than a child and is able to overcome them. And so, if they choose, you know, to just blatantly take something away from that child, including their life. The child has no defense. So there's no way that in a system like that, you're ever going, it's not, it's not balancing out really. It's just the old people are going to feed off of the young until there aren't any left. Oh, right, right. <laughs> I mean, I, I, that's what I think is the, the inevitable result of that. Yeah. I mean, I definitely don't endorse that or anything, but it's kind of <laughs> like a weird cause and effect. You know, it's not something where like the elite gain immortality by eating a lot of pears, you know, it's like the cause of their sticking around uh, would also affect the upcoming population of the planet. It's just a, a strange cause and effect. But I also did want to ask you about one real world example of this agenda of the elite and or maybe they're being uh, uh, controlled by the beings that they're communicating with. But you wrote about Obama's recent trip to Stonehenge saying that it was a further effort for from the elite to open up a portal between this world and, and the next. And I've had other guests who talk about this kind of thing and that being one of the major agendas of the elite. Can you expand on that trip at all? Do you have any insights as to how it was more than just a, a, a trip to an interesting monument, but more it was like a, an actual attempt to further this agenda? Well, I'm just sort of reading into things that appear in the news and in uh, pop culture these days. Like I said, you see what can be interpreted as references to both of these events in Eden, Eden that I'm describing and also a uh, future apocalyptic event. And just like you said, it's uh, uh, one, of the, one of the, what the event really is, is this opening of, opening probably of hell, but also it's more like the collapsing of a, of a pillar. There's this image, there's this uh, idea that there's a pillar between uh, heaven and hell and earth connecting all these three realms and that if it's disturbed in any way then it will collapse and they will all sort of join together and some people think that this is what cern is going to do and in fact cern is all the people that run it are basically saying well we don't right. know what might happen <laughs> so and then uh, Steve, stephen hawking the other day is saying well that that is what's going to happen but uh as far as the the stonehenge thing yeah i mean it's weird you know these guys never just do anything off the cuff. Of course, there was a meaning to it, a reason why, you know, I'm subscribed to the White House YouTube channel and I always get pissed off every day. Like, this, <laughs> why you make a video about that, but you don't make a video about this? And it's always some kind of self-congratulatory advertisement for how great Obama is. 
It's so disgusting. So anyway, this mm-hmm. is just one of those. He's supposed to make him look cool. And ooh, look at me. I'm at Stonehenge. But, um, you know, yeah, they, they choose which ones they're going to do every day. And the way they presented this one, it definitely looked like he's he walks in and he's like getting the information from the curator of the place about where's the exact center of the monument and where was where's the sun on the solstice it's over there oh okay and like as though he's like this master mason you know who has this deep understanding of sacred geometry and and he's like it's so wonderful being here i can feel the power Mm -hmm. and uh (laughs) and then he like winks at the camera too as he's doing this he's like spreading his arms out pointing towards where the sun would be during the solstice and he winks at the camera and it's just kind of I don't know. Maybe it, it was meant to make him look like some sort of deity, yeah. being. Yes, I get that. I mean, for someone who's looking into this type of thing, you gotta raise your eyebrow to something like that. With all the things going on in the world, we're supposed to be so afraid of ISIS. We're supposed to be so afraid of Russia. You're going to Stonehenge. The leader of our country is hanging out at Stonehenge. It, it does make make you seem a little skeptical if you're clued into this occult stuff. Yeah, and so yeah, I do I do see a lot of references really that could be interpreted as ushering in a new age that's literally collapsing these pillars and merging the worlds like I'm talking about and opening up the gates of hell, which is another thing that has emerged in the news lately. You know, Joseph Biden said it, oh, we're going to op- we're going to follow Isis to the gates of hell. And he repeats it like two or three times to the very gates of hell. <laughs> hell is where they'll reside. Yeah, I saw that too. I mean, you know, uh, it could be nothing, uh, but, um, you know, I just have my eyes open, like I said. And and as far as, is this something they're trying to do? Well, just from my own experience, I told you that they, you know, persuaded me to do certain things. And it wasn't just laid out in the beginning. It was like I followed a path. I was pulled along like a fish on a hook. Mm-hmm. Do this and you'll get this. Do this. And it was all about, like write a book about this, write an article about this and present it in this way or present this information. And, uh, and then they wanted, they, I had a, you know, this whole, all the spirit communications was sort of under the auspices of what my friends and I were calling the Ordo Lapsed Exilus. This was our little secret society group. And eventually the spirits persuaded us to open it up to the public, take members from the public, get blood oaths from them sent to us through the mail. Yikes. And then they wanted me to write a book for the second degree members of of the order. So I uh, basically went into a trance one day and wrote this thing in one day. Uh, I didn't quite finish it because I got scared at the end, actually. Damn. Uh, it was a really freaky thing. Yeah, I mean, the, the document was really scares me even to this day. And but I put excerpts from that, large excerpts. Most of most of the document really ended up in clock shavings. The the thing was called the Strange Service Manual. <laughs> and uh, in there, I just it's it's a manual for what the quartermasters of the order, who were also eligible to be priests if they wanted to. We had we were trying to form and organize a priesthood, as we called it, and then writing magic rituals for how to contact Baphomet and then form a contract with him uh, for your local lodge. And uh, you and your local lodge could do all these rituals and, uh, you know, it would have various results. So the book had all these rituals in it and also the, uh, just the description of what the order's purpose was and what it was trying to do, what the purpose of the relationship with Baphomet was. And, um, so what it ended up being, like one of the last chapters of the book, was all about um, what was called the divine right. Mm-hmm. And I'm channeling all this, you know. I, this is the only thing that I've ever written where I would say it was as close to automatic writing as I've ever gotten. Wow. Um, and anyway, so what it was is the divine right is this thing that we would do once a year around December 23rd, uh, where we would do a ritual pretending to be um, crowning the grail king and that every year as we would do uh, well, the ritual goes like this that uh, you crown him and then you sacrifice him and then he is possessed with the spirit of Baphomet wow. and Baphomet through him and be, he becomes this transcendent transcended being 
and rule you know becomes then the lord of the earth somehow and uh is able to rule the earth <laughs> wow well you know crowning him and sacrificing him where have we seen that before you know that's jesus right there yeah yeah well um yeah it's <laughs> at, at any rate so the idea was that we do this every year and at the time we were also the ordo lapsed exilus actually became connected to this other thing called the Dragon Court that I was involved in at the time. And the guy uh, running it at the time was uh, Nicholas de Vere. He called himself Nic Prince Nicholas de Vere von D Drakenberg. And he said that there, he was the king of this kingdom called Drakenberg. And that it was like this right. He, well, first of all, he said that he was a dragon. Dragons are like basically descendants of these fallen angels that I'm talking about. And he believed that they, people of this bloodline, had extra special magical powers and that they were the rightful heirs to certain thrones but he called the 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 kingdom that they that he ruled supposedly drakenberg and he said that uh he, he actually went around saying that like the the government of england and other people and governments throughout the world would were recognized his kingdom and uh that once it was created they would they would uh you know give it official recognition Hmm. So we, we were connected with these people at the time. And so when we were talking about creating the Grail Kingdom, we actually had this in mind, literally, that this guy was going to be the Grail King and be put on the throne. And then basically, you know, play out what seemed to be the role of the Antichrist, once you think about it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and the reason why we took his claim seriously at all was simply because that's what Baphomet told us. Uh, at the time... I was friends with this guy. I was trying to help him publish a book, or I had told him I was going to help him publish a book, but I really wasn't trying very hard. I, I was busy with other things. <laughs> and uh, at one point, Baphomet told us that she, Baphomet, had cursed us because we hadn't fulfilled our requirements to Nicholas de Vere to help him publish the book. And we said, you know, why do you care about Nicholas de Vere? And she, uh, we're told, because she is related. Baphomet is related to Nick. So um, the the spirits basically told us at the time that they were corroborating in large part what Nicholas was saying about himself. And if you think Weird. about it, Drakenberg is probably hell. You know, that's what that's actually the conclusion that I came to as I was writing this book and what gave me enough chills to, to put down my pen and say, OK, I have to think about what I'm doing here, you know, because I'm basically <laughs> yeah. describing a ritual that would open up the gates of hell, let this being Baphomet come through. And possess this person. <laughs> Man, yeah. Obama doesn't need to go to Stonehenge. You're going to do the work for him. Yeah, well, fortunately, or maybe fortunately, I guess, uh, uh, Nick didn't seem to have become the Antichrist <laughs> at all. He, he's dead now, so right on. someone else will have to play that role, I guess. Well, I wanted to double back a little bit to the yeah. pillars pillars collapsing symbolism because of course we're recording this on september 10th it's going to go up in a couple of days uh you know i'm kind of sick of the 9 11 thing over so many years and i don't want to do a 9 11 show every year on this date but it's interesting do you think there is any type of occult you know connection or symbolism between the twin towers collapsing and the elite trying to usher in this type of portal opening Probably. I mean, really, you know, yeah, if that event was planned, and even if it wasn't a conspiracy of the governments, it was probably somehow, see, so many things are being coordinated by demons, I realize now, you know? I mean, I don't mean, I, I know it sounds crackpot to just <laughs> declare that, but I, I mean, honestly, this is just what I think is going on. You, there are these weird coincidences that happen, and you think, how could the conspiracy be that vast? But it isn't. They're just, they're working through people's minds. Mm-hmm in very subtle ways so uh you know anything really you know could be interpreted as somehow uh being an omen of of what might be coming down the pike here and it's frightening to think about because i enjoy living and <laughs> i don't <laughs> i don't want time to stop or anything <laughs> kind of what they keep talking about is not just um apocalyptic mass death and things like that although that's part of the story that's just part of it. And yeah, like you said, pillars collapsing, that's like the, really the end of the story, where what it results in finally is basically a separation, like an alchemical separation of elements. 
of the good guys and the bad guys, the good souls and the bad souls. And they get put into the things that are going to get preserved, get put into the ark, into the one box of things. And the, this is described in Revelation as the New Jerusalem. It's this cubic city that descends from the sky. And all the righteous people go inside and their, their names are written in the book of life. If their name isn't written there, it's like you don't exist. You're stuck outside the gates of the cube. Hmm. And outside is chaos. <laughs> and so uh, this is what I think is happening. And there's a game being played right now where the demons, the ones that are trapped on the lower realm, think that they can play this game right in such a way that they will be the ones on the inside piloting the ark in control of reality at the end. <laughs> but how to play their cards just right because otherwise everything that the book of revelation says will happen which is the preservation of these few righteous souls in this uh, cubic city as it's called it's not really i mean it's a city in a very weird sense not in a traditional sense mm -hmm. but uh everything outside is going to be utterly annihilated so <laughs> does not sound good no, I mean, and it's not, and also too, you think, well, it'll be annihilated, so it'll be no big deal. You know, at the end, you don't, if you've been annihilated, you won't know it because you won't be there, right? Yeah, that's but, true. But for some, I don't think that's the end of it. I mean, it's described as the lake of fire. They describe this eternal pain, damnation. So, and I think it's kind of like the realm that they're in now, only maybe worse, you know, because the realm they're, that they're in now, they, they say that they don't exist or that they're not alive and yet you can communicate with them and they're doing things. So it means that they're somehow having to endure the pain of death, but there's still, there's still some consciousness there. Wow. So uh, I think that somehow that's what happens in the end. And uh, yeah, so I, I'd <laughs> rather it happen later. Or oh, yeah, of course. Um, Man, this is all so fascinating, and it's a whole different take on a lot of things that are talked about in, cons in the conspiracy world all the time, but without this added context, so they seem a little bit off. One example, I've heard you say in other interviews that you don't think it makes sense for the elite to just leave us a code. You know, a lot of people talk about, oh, well, all these symbols and stuff, they're telling us what they're doing. They're leaving us a code to figure out, and I'm with you. I don't really think that makes much sense at all, and you kind of alluded that it's probably, the reason we see it is probably just for the sake of the magic itself. Yeah. And one more thing about 9-11 that I'm curious about is, you know, a lot of people talk about these references to it that have existed in movies and television way before the actual event. You know, in, in The Matrix, Neo's passport expires on September 11, 2001. Uh, it's, yeah. The Simpsons had a reference to it. The Rugrats movie had a reference to it. And now I'm almost wondering if this is the demonic muse, you know, the influence of the, uh, the subconscious of humanity trying to push us towards that type of event. Just a weird thought but i think that actually makes more sense than the idea that the elite have just been laying out the breadcrumbs way before the event yeah i i think uh that this is beyond human planning basically so uh yeah all these little breadcrumbs <laughs> as they're thought of yeah in the way they are bread, breadcrumbs because i do think that these things are meant you're meant to meditate on them and kind of be entranced by them and be affected by them but the purpose really is to, but through your mind, contemplating it, that affects reality. See, this is the this is the role I think we play. Why they, they the demons, resent us and also need to somehow take what we have and control it is because we were put in the position of interpreting reality and thereby, in in a way, can defining it if not creating it. You know, God's the creator, but somehow we're very instrumental in create in in defining it. Yes. Through our perception. That's what they, that's one of the things they need us for. And they're trying to utilize us, drive us like a vehicle to uh, not only do certain things, but believe certain things because when we believe them, it makes them true. <laughs> yeah, right. Uh, so, <laughs> um, yeah, I think that some of these, these stories and archetypes that we get exposed to over and over again. Just, that's the effect that it has. It has, a, like you said, a magical effect. Every time we're exposed to it, it is a ritual. And um, it, it, 
doesn't necessarily matter whether we're consciously aware of what it means or not. Right. Although more and more people are becoming consciously aware of it, but it's almost too late at this point. I mean, I'm out of my depth completely when it comes to trying to analyze this stuff. I mean, for one thing, I'm not really as plugged into pop culture as others. So I don't know what's going on in music. And uh, I I don't even, I had to cancel my TV subscription a couple of weeks ago. I never even watched it. <laughs> so I don't know what's, what all is going on. But when I, every time I look into it, you know, I'm just overwhelmed. This, I couldn't, I could spend the rest of my life analyzing this stuff. And I would never, there would be so much more produced in the time that I spent writing about it. <laughs> yeah, it is definitely confusing at times. But so let's say you got these demons or these fallen angels, these entities, and they've been persistent for who knows how long, thousands of years, maybe hundreds of thousands of years. And now they're getting help from the powerful puppet masters on the planet. I mean, it seems like things are ramping up and this is a, a weird time. But I mean, what can we do? to i guess fight back and not just like acknowledge it and sit and wait for it to happen i mean it seems like a pretty devastating time i mean is it inevitable is there anything we can do um to have a more positive outcome here i i think it might be uh inevitable yeah ouch <laughs> if it's gonna happen so uh i mean you know little things like trying to well even that i was going to say you know a few weeks ago, or a few years ago i used to do interviews sometimes about economics and people would say what can we do and you know i would give advice about well maybe you know somehow trying to have you know a revolution or create self sufficiency for yourself but that's just about pre preserving yourself from financial ruin and obviously there's no advice if there's a mass death from nuclear war or diseases these things seem like they're impending and coming um and then the larger thing of course is the collapsing of the pillars i really don't think we can do anything about that <laughs> it's a much larger plan it's, and it's been in the works from the beginning this was all programmed in from the beginning man so I guess, let me ask you then, If can you give us any other examples of events in modern times that to you might might point to possible attempts to open portals or have some type of relationship to doing the work of these entities? Well, you know, everything that I might list would just be sort of a ritual and hypnotic uh, effort, and there's many of those. But mm -hmm. as far as actually trying to break open the gates, it's CERN. I mean, they've said that that's what they're doing. And it's all throughout their logos and what they choose to call their projects. The interviews that they do with what they say their, their uh, experiments are. They talk about literally opening portals. But they, they say, oh, they're so tiny. They're tiny little <laughs> portals. Nothing to worry about. They're only open for a little bit of time, just a, a fraction of a second. Wait. I mean, how long does it take for the universe to end? Uh, how how much of an opening do you have to make? I, I don't think that that can be measured or described. Right. I don't know what makes them, they're so confident about it. I mean, I guess maybe they're, they've got big balls because they've done so many things working with the models of theoretical physics and they've been right or they feel like they've been right. But I also think that I've always just thought theoretical physics is just kind of not totally crackpotish, but just as you're exploring the quantum realms of uh, atoms, I think they just keep finding what they're looking for. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's, isn't that part of the description of what quantum reality is that you're projecting so much of it? Right. The observer effect. Well, I mean, it seems to me, you know, this is my just amateur observation is that they keep coming up with imaginary, uh, particles and then they find them mm -hmm. and I, I don't know uh what the failure rate is but it just seems like the more they look the more they find what they think they're going to find yeah like the more the more energy or the more uh the more detailed the concept you know as the as the concept or idea the theory gets more defined um then eventually yeah. they find it maybe that speaks to the human's ability to co-create the universe uh, it probably does, um, but yeah, I, I can't. I don't. I don't understand what they're doing, and I don't think that very many people do. 
And that's really what's scary about it. No one knew what the people with the atom bomb were doing, really. You couldn't... <laughs> it's very hard to just, to wrap your mind around it when they're trying to describe what they did to make that bomb. Well, and that's how... That was, uh, you know, a long time ago. What they're doing now is way more complicated. Right. And, uh, again, I just don't necessarily believe that they have a handle on the consequences. Plus, you got to think, well, what if these guys are just possessed mad scientists what, what i experienced with the way that talking to demons changed my perspective what i thought was reasonable and what i would be willing to do basically just be, and i basically thought i was just following the program because hey it's working you know they're talking to me i'm learning the secrets of magic uh i might as well just follow the program because i'm learning so much well if they're under a similar spell whether they realize it or not from demons, then their perspective of what they should go ahead and try uh, is is warped. <laughs> and they may know that they're opening a portal and think, oh, it'll be great. I'll, you know, we'll bring the demons in and they'll, it'll be a revolution. You know, like you've read um, the Book of the Law and right. the way Aleister Crowley portrays the apocalypse. I mean, obviously... He was being told basically he and his friends are going to be, you know, the top cocks in the new world mm -hmm. order. And it's okay that everyone else is dying because you'll be, in, you'll have your own seats of power and you'll be wealthy and be able to do whatever you want. Well, I doubt that, <laughs> you know, <laughs> once, once the gate is open, basically, there's no restraint uh, from these beings and uh, right. I don't, I don't, yeah, they're not going it's, to hold their promises. It's kind of like the sequel to Aladdin because we know Jafar turns into a genie, an all powerful genie, and he's put in the lamp. And then he has to coax someone to bring him out. And then oh. once he's out, he's like, I don't give a fuck about you. I'm going to kill you. You know, I'm going to just own everything. You're, you're screwed now. Oh, so, yeah. Well, man. Yeah. This has been a real blast. I mean, it's depressing. It's definitely dark, but I always am willing to explore what's going on beneath the veil, beneath the surface. And if that stuff is dark, then so be it. It doesn't mean it should be avoided. It means it should be talked about and understood. So I really appreciate the conversation. I had like eight pages of questions here. We got to page two and then just went off into crazy land. And I <laughs> loved it. I loved it. But I hope someday we can uh, have another conversation and talk more about the alchemical properties of, of money and the control system there because that's a whole can of worms as well. But um, before I really do let you go, do you want to let the people know again about your website and where they can pick up some of your previous books and your newest book? Yes, yes. TracyTwyman.com is my website. 